Welcome to our lecture online. Let's put together to try and determine the general. Can I start over again? No. <laughs> huh? All right. Pendulum was Cavendish pendulum. Cavendish. Welcome to our lecture online. One of the great applications in history of the torsional pendulum was the pendulum that Cavendish put together in order to measure the universal gravitational constant g. Now actually what he tried to do was try to measure the mass and the density of the earth, but in essence that was the same thing as finding g. So let's see how he did that. Well he put together a pendulum where there were two large masses, each of them a, a mass of 158 kilograms, and next to that he placed two very small masses on a balance that would then go ahead and be able to move back and forth and that was then suspended to the ceiling that would then come straight out of the board here so we basically have a bird's eye view on that and of course the force of gravity would attract the small mass to the large mass over on both sides and then once you set this in motion you would have what we call torsional motion going back and forth and based upon the period we should be able to calculate g let's see how we did that well first of all we know that the torque is going to be equal to twice the force between these two masses because there's two of them one on each side and of course it would be force times distance and that's the definition of torque since there's two of them and the force then, of course, would be the equation do, that Newton came up with to calculate the force of gravity, which is the constant g that we're looking for, times the product of the two masses divided by the distance between them squared. Let's assume that that is equal to r from center mass to center mass. That is the torque required to shift from the equilibrium point to the maximum displacement. Therefore, the total delta t, or delta torque, that we are looking for would be twice that amount because it would have to go away from the equilibrium point in one direction and away from the equilibrium point in the other direction. So that would give us the delta t required to shift between the maximum displacements. Now next what we're going to do is start with this basic equation in linear motion that the force on a spring is equal to minus k times x and when we translate that to torsional motion like this or a torsional balance, we have the torque is equal to minus, instead of k, we have kappa, and instead of x, we're going to have the angle theta, the displacement in the angle. And then, of course, since we're looking for the change in the torque, the delta torque, we then cause a delta angle. Now, notice that he was able to measure the delta angle. The delta angle times the distance that would be this distance arm right here will give us the arc length and the arc length was measured to be 7.45 meters for the total displacement. Oop, not meters of course, but millimeters. So what do we do next? Well, we're going to replace delta tau, the delta torque, by what that is equal to right here. So we can write this as 4 times g m big M divided by the radius squared times d is equal to, and that would be the minus kappa, and of course it doesn't matter if it's minus kappa or positive kappa, we're simply looking for the magnitude, so we're going to drop the negative sign, not needed, times the change in theta. The plan of attack, since it was able to measure the period, and the period was quite a long one, it was 852 seconds, we're going to find the value for kappa, from this equation and plug that into this equation right here to solve for the period t and hopefully by knowing that the moment of inertia is 2m times d squared we might be able to get rid of the small masses. Let's do that. Let's solve for kappa and so this tells us that kappa is equal to on the left side we have 4g m big m times d divided by, on the denominator, we're going to with r squared times delta theta. Now this can be plugged into this equation right here to solve for the period, and we can then replace i by what i is equal to. So let's do that. The period is going to be equal to 2 pi times the square root of i, which is 2 times the small mass times d squared, 
divided by, in the denominator we get kappa, which is going to be 4g times small m times big M times d to the first power divided by r squared times delta theta. But of course, that will come to the numerator. That will give us r squared times delta theta in the numerator. Now we can simplify some things here. First of all, the small masses cancel out. This d will cancel out one of those d's, and this 2 becomes a 1 when this 4 becomes a 2. So let's rewrite what we have left. Let's see what that is equal to. So this is equal to 2 pi times the square root of, in the numerator we end up with a single d with r squared with delta theta. In the denominator we end up with 2 times g times big M. Now notice we have everything we need. So let's see what we have here. We have r, r is known, that's the distance between the two spheres, which is 230 millimeters. We know d times delta theta, which is the arc length of motion, known to be 7.45 millimeters. We know the mass of the large spheres, and g is what we're looking for, and the period was also known to be 852 seconds, which means we can solve this equation now for g. We're going to square both sides, and bring g over here. So when I square both sides, I end up with the following. I end up with t squared is equal to 4 pi squared times what's left here, which is d delta theta times r squared times 2gm. And then you can see I can solve that for g. g is equal to, and that would be 4 pi squared in the numerator times d delta theta times r squared divided by the period squared times g 2 and times m. And that is what he was after. Of course, he wasn't actually after g. What he eventually wanted to know was he wanted to know the mass and the density of the earth, which he was able to do that once he knew this constant. But let's go ahead and try to calculate this constant from basically from his experiment. Now I know that some of you may say, well, all these numbers are not quite what you see when you look at references. There are some discrepancies in what the actual numbers were, but let's go ahead and plug in what we have here. So this would be equal to 4 pi squared multiplied times d delta theta, which is 0 0.00745 meters, because we have to convert to meters. R squared, convert to meters, that 230 millimeters, it's 0 0.23 meters squared. And divide the whole thing by the period. So this would be meters right here. The period is 852 seconds. We have to square that times 2 and times the mass of 158 kilograms. I've seen references where they said that was closer to 154 kilograms. I'm not sure what the actual value was. So g is equal to, now remember from our classes we know that g is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Well, let's see what we get. 4 times pi squared times 0 0.00745 times 0 0.23 squared divide by 852 squared. Divide by 2 and divide by 158. And notice I end up with 6.78 times 10 to the minus 11. Now the units would be newtons, that would be meter squared per kilogram squared. Now that's not very different from the actual value of 6.67. Matter of fact, that is about 1 to 2 percent difference. And notice that Cavendish, with very clever thinking, was actually able to come up with a constant that was very close to the actual constant that we now know. And so he was able to measure the mass and the density of the Earth quite accurately as well. Quite a feat for something that was done almost 200 years ago. And that's how we know what he did.